in our heart is we're not sitting there, but Christ himself is sitting in our heart, ruling our life as Lord and King. So we say the same word over and over and over again, but it's deep worship. You walk out of the confessional forgiven and free. Welcome again to the Catholic video presentation Evangelium, which explores the riches, richness of the Catholic Church. I'm privileged to narrate this video, and it's such a gift to be with you. I hope it's really helping you understand what it means to be Catholic. And those maybe who are not Catholic or have been away from the church for a long time, I hope this is enriching your life and you understand more and more the gift of the church. Tonight, we're going to look at uh, a very important aspect of our faith. We're going to continue to pray and, and to look, about, look at the Eucharist, especially how to pray the Mass. But before, again, I'd like to start out with a prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas, the doctor of the church, a very important theologian. Most of our dogma and dogma are built, built on his theological reflection. So let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Bestow on me, O God, an understanding that knows you, wisdom in finding you, a way of life that is pleasing to you, perseverance that faithfully waits for you, and confidence that I shall embrace you at the last. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So we are going to talk about praying the Mass and then the scrush of the Mass. And, and I, I think every one, of, every one of us as Catholics have a difficulty in praying the Mass to be attentive to what's happening. And, and yet, I, I think when you understand the Mass more and more, it's easier to be more attentive to what's happening. And the gift of the Eucharist, the gift of the Mass, the gift of, of what we receive uh, in the body and blood and soul and divinity of our Lord in communion. You know, I just want to read a passage before we begin from a friend of mine, Scott Hahn, who was a Presbyterian minister, anti-Catholic, uh, became Catholic and for two reasons. One was the Eucharist. He found such a, a deep uh, biblical or understanding of the Eucharist. And here's his conversion uh, to that. I quickly slipped into the basement chapel down at Marquette. They were having a new mass. I never had gone to mass before. I sat down in the back pew. I didn't kneel. I didn't genuflect. And then I watched 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 people come in. They genuflected. They kneeled and they prayed. Then the bell rang. The priest came in. The liturgy of the word was so rich, not only scriptural readings, they read the scriptures, but the Prayers were soaked with biblical imagery, phrases of Isaiah and Ezekiel. I, I was saying, man, stop the show. Let me explain the prayers. This is Isaiah. This is Ezekiel. This is Zechariah. This is where I belong, he said. Then the liturgy of the Eucharist began. I watched and listened as the priest pronounced the words of consecration and elevated the host. And I confess, the last drop of doubt drained away from me. I looked and said, my Lord and my God. As the people began going forward to receive communion, I literally began to drool, saying, Lord, I want you. I want to have this communion with you. You've come into my heart. You're my personal Savior and Lord. But now I think I want to come into, onto my tongue and to my stomach and, and my body and my soul and have this communion complete. As soon as I began, it was over. People's, people stayed a minute or two to pray, and I knew it was for me a place I needed to be. So I went again and again and again and again. I was head over heels in love with Christ and his real presence in the Blessed Sacrament. Isn't that a beautiful explanation? of falling in love with the Eucharist. And I think that's hopefully as we go through these, these videos that we'll come to know in a deeper way what we really have. You know, the Eucharist is not about me, it's not about you, it's about Christ. It's about his sacrifice for us on the cross. It's all about worshiping God. And when we get out of the picture, we take ourselves out of the picture, then we realize it's not entertainment. It's not someplace I go to be thrilled. It's someplace I go to be before God. And that's, a, that's an amazing gift to come every Sunday and to do that deep worship 
in Christ Jesus. So let's now look at how we pray the Mass better. And here's again, we start with a, a key definition every time in these videos, so it kind of sums up what we're about to experience. Praying the Mass is fully conscious and active participation in the Eucharist. So it's, we understand what we're doing, we've prepared somehow, and this participation is prayerfully engagement in the Mass aided by proper understanding, good preparation, and application of its power and blessings to our lives. So it's really asking of us to do something with our minds and our hearts, and even before we come to church. So we bring ourselves to the, to the, the Mass, not the last minute, say, oh, I gotta go to Mass, but already there's a preparation. And I know this is hard work. I know this is more difficult when you have children and you're getting ready to go to church, but there are ways that we can actually get prepared, and then that preparation sets us up to participate more fully in the Eucharist. So here we have, again, a beautiful picture of the Mass. There's Jesus. He's pronouncing the, his consecration that the priest pronounces. There's the one cup and one bread, the emphasis on the communion that we'll be receiving. You know, in a picture like this, it's always interesting. Judas is always present, but if you remember in John's Gospel, he never stayed for communion. He left because Satan entered his heart. And so there he is. He's the only apostle that doesn't have uh, a halo. And then the tree is uh, in the back of the picture is the cross of Christ. So it's again a picture that indicates what's going on here. What's going on here is the sacrifice of Calvary, Christ giving himself on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And that's what we receive, that salvation every time we come to the Mass. Now, preparing for the Mass, I think we can do many things, but here, Mass nourishes the Christian life, conforming it us to Christ. Growth in the Christian life is turned, gives us a deeper insight and love of the Mass. So we bring our Christian life to the church. When you realize the Mass is a biblical presentation, a beautiful sense of the Bible, everything through, them, through the scriptures is biblically oriented in the Mass. And so it's, 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 it's more understandable once you start in, investing yourselves and in reading the scriptures and more, doing more prayer, the Mass is gonna take on an incredible a presence in your life. So here we can prepare for the Mass, meditating on the scriptures or reading before, the night before, maybe reading the scriptures beforehand. Now, why would you do this? Because you want to get more out of the Mass, you have to put more into it, more into our prayer. And so the scriptures for the Sunday are easily found on now on any kinds of apps or on the internet. You could just do a simple reading preparing, so you're already oriented towards the Word of God, that what God wants to speak to you in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass on Sunday morning. Do you realize that is those scriptures are chosen and they're gonna be proclaimed throughout the whole world. Everywhere it's the same scriptures on a Sunday Mass in the Catholic Church. That's a billion people are gonna hear the Word of God. So that is the Word that's being proclaimed out to the, to the nations. And wouldn't it be appropriate if you're coming to Mercy to already have that word in your heart, getting ready to hear about the scriptures and maybe the reflection of the homily helping us understand what God is saying to us that day. And then not only that, studying the prayers and the structure of the Mass, we'll do a little bit of that today. You know, some people are, take, are bringing a missal to, to Mass now or a missal that helps help them pray the structure of the Mass. That's very helpful. It's also helpful. Uh, to have, to, to come in and even physically be ready. So you come into the church, you make a sign of the cross, you, you look at the blessed sacrament of the tabernacle, you look at the, the Jesus is present, you genuflect, your body is already saying, I'm here to worship. What I'm, done, what I'm here for is not just to be entertained, but I'm here to give myself to make my life a sacrifice to Christ as I worship. So you're physically already recognizing why you're here. I think that's so, so very important. To prepare for communion then. Now this is very important, I think, we have to really recognize to be in a state of grace, to receive communion. That means that if there's a mortal sin on our soul, we have to go to confession. We can't just 
it would be it would be condemnation for us to take the Eucharist. It would, it would be a, a sickness, a spiritual sickness, to do this. So we need to have at least uh, uh, go to confession of mortal sin. And obviously, even if you don't have a mortal sin, it's a good thing to practice confession on a regular basis to kind of clean up the heart and the soul. And so, and the other, the people don't understand that there is a, yet a fast, why? Because this is spiritual food. We're preparing our hearts and our souls to receive Jesus Christ. That means we wanna have a body ready for that. And so there's a fast, a one hour fast is all it is, one hour. I remember as a child, we had 24 hour fast. We, had, we couldn't eat beyond midnight the night before Holy, uh, that we would have Holy Communion. So this is not too uh, difficult. And, and so it is, it's good to keep that fast as kind of a, a mental thing to say, this is something very special. I'm going to fast just in this last hour before the Eucharist so that my have a, a little bit of a hunger for the Lord, maybe. So now during the Mass, how, how do we pray? We can participate generally by uh, being attentive, by uh, interior prayers, the word, being attentive to the words and actions of the priest. I often think that people think I, the priest prays and I listen. But I think you need to understand the priest prays for you doesn't mean you don't pray. That means you might hear the prayer and make that prayer yours. Uh, the priest prays as the head and leader of the community, but that doesn't mean the community sits back and just listens, you see? I think that makes a big difference in your participation in the Eucharist. You're called to pray along with the priest, using his words in your own mind, in your own heart, hearing them, making them your own. And then the gestures that we have, that taking seriously the gestures. When you make a sign of the cross, realizing that you, this is one of the most profound prayers you can ever make. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole theology behind the sign of the cross that says you are not only protected, but you're proclaiming the Trinity, you're proclaiming the salvation message of Christ. You're, you, it is just have so many deep meanings. And so any gestures, kneeling, that we kneel well, we, kneel, <laughs> we, we stand, we stand with a dignity. So every gesture that we make is a conscious choice to be a person of worship, a person of prayer. I think that's, a, that's one, I would say, a very important aspect of the Mass. Now, during the Mass itself, responding when we do sing, when we can sing again after this COVID experience, we'll, be have, we'll have a tremendous ability to really recover uh, what it means to praise God with song. And I think that most of us will be so thankful when we can do this again, that we're just gonna raise the roof in any church. We're just gonna sing God's praises when we finally can sing our songs again. And then maintain a prayerful silence after you receive the Eucharist. You go up to Eucharist, you receive the body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ in your hand and your tongue, you go back and it's not a time to chat. You, you become a living tabernacle. Like Scott Hahn said, you know, he, 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 Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior, but now he's in me, my body, and, and his divinity is mixing with my humanity, and I, I now am a, a tabernacle of the Lord. And so I, I think to pray what the gift that we receive in the Eucharist, to, to have that sense of reverence at the end, when we just take a time to pray about what we've received. I know many Catholics that it's not, uh, unusual to do that, but I, I just really recommend it in terms of our Mass. And after the Mass, it's good to spend a few minutes of prayer uh, in the church after Mass. I know many of us just want to get out and socialize or go home. It's not a bad thing to sit and just pray for a moment in thanksgiving what you've received and, and uh, to, to kind of almost debrief, like this has been amazing worship. This has been amazing gift that I've received. And uh, I think again, the value of the Mass and the value of the prayer in the Mass will, will show itself when you just raise up your ha heart in thanksgiving to the Lord. There's a way of thanking God for His blessings, for the many things you receive, uh, some resolutions. Maybe you're thinking about the homily at that time and say, you know, this really touched my heart. I, so you pray about that. So this is, Lord, just give me this sense of where I need to go next after this uh, Eucharistic celebration. So the difficulties with praying the Mass are very obvious. You know, it makes no sense. Well, the Mass is rich in meaning, unlikely to make uh, immediate sense of somebody who comes in to the Eucharist. 
somebody who celebrates the Eucharist uh, uh, over and over again, a ritual thing. It, it, it becomes ritual and then you, we don't, okay, what am I doing? So I guess that's what I'm asking Catholics today, to, to do a deeper reflection. What, what is the ritual that we pray every Sunday? Do we have, is it just a ritual or can we make it more personal? Now I, I also have a beautiful reflection, just a, a number I went on online to see how people uh, came into the Catholic faith. And here's a really lovely thing. Uh, I'd been attending Mass with my boyfriend for about a year. I enjoyed Mass, but I didn't, really didn't feel compelled to, compelled to be converted or didn't mind missing the Eucharist. But then one day, he went up for communion and I stayed in my seat as usual. I just began to overwhelm with sadness, started crying. I suddenly knew I was missing out on something amazing and I decided then to enroll and become Catholic. You know, it's surprising to me how that is not untypical. People will come to church, come to church, and all of a sudden they get the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit instructs them that there is something so amazing that you're missing. You, you all of a sudden have an emptiness inside, so I want that. Now, I, I would hope as well, you know, our Catholic people would occasionally just say, what am I receiving? Am I prepared to receive this great gift? Or afterwards, what did I receive? And so the making no sense, I think, can help this kind of video programs or studying about the Mass or, or, or studying about or, or praying uh, regular prayer life. It deepens our, our, our ability to pray in the Eucharist. So, and then boredom, the Mass is a prayer, something we need for our own souls. It's not mere entertainment, however, in practice, it will engage us deeply if we attend to the words, think and pray about what they mean. We can't just be passive. Again, I'm a listener and the priest is the prayer. I think that's unfair to the Eucharist. And so of course it's gonna be bored if I just sit there for one hour and don't think about anything or don't, don't meditate on what I'm hearing. But if I start understanding, if I open a missalette, or if I start praying what I hear, it's not gonna be boring. Maybe at times it will seem that way. Uh, our attention span is, is less probably than most times in history of humanity. We have a, a very small attention span, but nonetheless, if we start studying and praying, I think you're gonna find uh, the mass deeper, a deeper prayer experience than you've had before. And I think even for young children, they can bring their mass books and, or for teenagers. Uh, and um, I, I think we'll find something, uh, we'll find the Eucharist much deeper than we would experience it before, so. And then inability to receive communion. I think this is something for people who are struggling, people who are not Catholic. If you're not Catholic, even if you're baptized, uh, another faith, you really can't receive communion. You have to be a member of the Catholic Church. And so those who have come and, and are coming from different faiths, you know, Lutheran faith, Presbyterian faith, and say, well, well I believe in the real presence, that's, that's, that's fine. But you have to believe in the not only real presence, but what the family holds in the Eucharist, which is a, an embracing of the church teachings. And so um, it's not an exclusion somebody, it's just says that this is how, this is how Eucharist is meant to be given. Um, and I, I think, again, the church teaches that so, so well uh, on, on, from the very beginning. There are people who could not even be a part of the Mass itself. And there was a catechumenate, would not even be allowed to be at the Eucharistic prayer. They, they left at the time of the gospel and couldn't even be in the church when the Eucharistic prayer was being prayed and people, were, there, was a, there was a time when they had to be removed because the mysteries are so great that your heart has to be prepared and you have to, be, you have to learn what it means to receive and take time to study. That there is ways to become uh, spiritually uh, enlivened with the Eucharist. And we're experiencing that today uh, as we're having live streams and people are not able to come to the church that they are in spiritual communion. So here's the Mass in heaven. I think it's so beautiful, the most important. If praying the Mass realizes supernatural, miraculous dimension of the Eucharist, the sacrifice and the presence 
of heaven. So uh, Scott Hahn again wrote a book called uh, The Lamb's Supper. He says, every Sunday heaven comes down to earth and we go to heaven. So there's a sense of, of everything that we have in experience of the Eucharist uh, is going to be our experience in heaven, the love of the Father, the, the grace of the Son, the power of the Holy Spirit, the community gathered is going to be what we experience on Sunday. And I, I was given this beautiful picture uh, uh, from one of my uh, young uh, uh, children in the mass uh, in the church, and she uh, drew a picture of, of what the Eucharist was uh, for in her mind. And, and it's uh, Jesus smiling with the angels above it and all the disciples are smiling. If this is not your experience of Eucharist on Sunday, I want you to pray about it and really ask yourself, why not? She, she made a beautiful picture of, of the, of the uh, disciples, the apostles gathered around Jesus. And um, this is my, uh, a, a beautiful experience of what the Eucharist can be for us. A family meal, a family meal, but a, a meal of salvation and a, a, the, with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. So let's see now, I think. So Hebrews is a beautiful word. You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and innumerable angels, festive gatherings to the assembly of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven, the judge who is God of all, and the spirits of just men must perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator, and the covenant to be sprinkled, the blood of the lamb, graciously the blood of, of God. So is what is, Hebrews is describing what the Eucharist is, not only on earth, but in heaven. So let's just do a summary again. Uh, so this is a way to re reclaim what we've just learned in this video, and it's a, maybe a discussion areas. Praying the Mass is a fully conscious and active participation in the Eucharist. This is a prayerful engagement in the Mass, aided by proper understanding, the application of His power and blessings in our lives. That's the definition of what it means to pray the Mass. And then we pray the Mass well by good preparation, especially by going to confession, arriving early, by being attentive to the Mass, and uniting our own interior prayers to the words, actions, gestures of the priest. In other words, you have a prayer life, Mass is going to be able to be prayed. If you don't have a prayer life, Mass is not probably going to be a place where you're going to be able to pray because you're not, you don't have the disposition of prayer. You don't have the sense of what prayer is. Mass is one long prayer. It's, you can describe that as well. We should be always reverent towards the Eucharist, including keeping a fast for an hour uh, and then receiving communion when our hearts already when we've reconciled with God. Let's just uh, go over now what is it meant to be full, conscious, and active. We'll see if how well you do here. First is what? Prayerful engagement. Next. Proper understanding. Next. Good preparation. Next. Application to our lives. So prayer, understanding, preparation, and applying to our lives. And then we're going to be able to pray the Mass so much better. Now the structure of the Mass is very beautiful. So how did, how did we come up with this structure? There's an introductory rite, there's the liturgy of the Word, there's the liturgy of the Eucharist, there's a communion rite, and the concluding rite, which is a, a going forth after a blessing. Well, let, let me just say to you that this has been the way the church has been organized from the very beginning, from the Last Supper on. This is nothing new. This is how the ritual that was devised by the church, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And let me just read something to you that's pretty amazing. It's, on the, it's already um, 155, and St. Justin Martyr uh, wrote this. On the day we call the day of the sun, all who dwell in the city or country gather in the same place. The memoirs of the apostles, the writings of the prophets are read as much time permits. When the reader is finished, he who presides over them gathers admonishments and challenges them with, to, to imitate the beautiful things. That's a homily. Then we will all rise together, offer prayers for ourselves, prayers of the faithful, and for all others, whenever they may be. When the prayers are concluded, we exchange the kiss of peace. That's the kiss of peace, the peace be with you. 
And then somebody brings bread and a cup of water and wine, mix them together. He presides over the brethren. That's the, the Eucharistic rite where we offer the bread and the wine. He takes them, offers prayers and glory to the Father in the universe through the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit. For considerable time, he gives thanks, Eucharistine. Then he would judge worthy of the gifts. When he had concluded the prayer and thanksgiving, all the present proclaim what? Amen. That's a, the great amen at the end of the Eucharistic prayer. When he presides, he gives thanks and people respond and whom they call the deacons, give the Eucharist bread and wine and water, take them to those who are absent. So the, at the end of Mass, you remember where Eucharistic ministers go and take the Eucharist to the sick. It was initially, that's exactly what they did. Do you, do you recognize the structure? It's a structure that we have at every single Mass. That's 150 uh, uh, AD, after Christ. And so the liturgy structure is something that is for 2,000 years we maintain. There are certain things that happen because the translation of the prayers and all, but it's basically the same structure. Let's just look at the introduction, right? So this is just a reminder. If you can name all these and have a sense of what we're doing, you can have a structure of where we're going, it's going to be much easier to pray the Mass. If it's kind of a surprise and what's this, this is going to be much more difficult. See, ritual helps us to pray. See, ritual is very important. You have a ritual in your home. When you get up, when you go to bed, when you eat, it, it, that ritual it, it makes us comfortable, gives us a sense of being together. And so if we have a ritual that we pray in the Eucharist, the way that we celebrate, then that's going to help us pray the Eucharist. So the entrance and greeting is the sign of the cross, the mass of the two mysteries of, uh, the mysteries of faith, the cross, and the Holy Trinity. So you begin with the cross of Christ, which is that is what we're celebrating, and we proclaim who God is as a Trinitarian God. The next is very important. People don't realize there's actually a penitential rite at the very beginning. It's not just a casual thing we throw out there, but it really is a presentation. If there's venial sins, if there's ways in which your heart's not happy, if there's hearts that need to be cleaned up before the Eucharist, this is the time. It's actually a time of, of forgiveness. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault is truly a confession. And it's, what's really beautiful is the whole church does this. It's not just not individual, but the whole community says we prepare ourselves to, to celebrate and to receive this great gift of the Eucharist by having a penitential rite. And then one of the most beautiful hymns, ancient hymns, the very early church uh, proclaiming the, the hymn of the Gloria, glory to God in the highest. It's based not only on, on uh, the angel's proclamation, the fields to the shepherds at, uh, in, in Bethlehem when Jesus was born, but also a theological presentation of we worship him, we, we praise you, we honor you, we, we give you our, ourselves. It's a beautiful sense of worship. It, and that starts the Eucharist, doesn't it? So the Gloria really starts then, this is what we're about. We're starting to worship the Father. Then the priest gathers everything up to that point. It's called the colic or the collective prayer. And it ends with, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. That's usually pr pretty much how all the prayers uh, end. Through Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, and in the Father, God forever. Then we begin the liturgy of the words. So now that's the introduction. We're ready now. We've collected our prayer. We're sitting down. Now our tension is that God's going to speak to us through his holy scriptures. And the church has organized the scriptures in such a way that we can actually, in every three years, we read almost the entire Bible. Every Catholic, if you're attending Mass on Sunday and some on the weekdays, you'll be reading the entire Bible in a three-year pattern. So the first of the readings is a proclamation of the Old Testament, uh, it, which penetrates our hearts and minds, and that we can know God, His works, and how He, how he is seen in the Old Testament, and how He is proclaimed in the Old Testament as a prefigurement to what is going to come in the New Testament or when Christ comes. There's so many beautiful, what's called typology, types that we find, you know, you have Moses in the Old Testament, well, Jesus is the new Moses. You have David the king in the Old Testament, Jesus is the new king. He has prophets. Jesus is the prophet that brings about uh, proclaiming the word of God uh, and, be, and actually is the word of God. 
And then there's a psalm between the readings, between a, a, usually a, an Old Testament and a New Testament, one of the epistles of Paul, very much like I just read in Justin Martyr, where they would read the, he would say, read the letters of the apostles, read the letters of Paul. And then you have a gospel. The gospel is, is the most uh, prominent reading of the day. And that's why you understand we sit when you, when you hear the Old Testament and the epistles of Paul, but we stand when we hear the gospel because it's, it's profound. It's, it's a way of showing that this, this particular reading is a profound invitation to enter into the life of Christ. And so the gospel is the words of Jesus, his actions, his healing, his ministry. And we get then ready after that we sit down and what happens? We have a homily that explains uh, some points of the biblical reading or teaches truth. So we have a, a, a way of expanding. Now, just think, if you had read those readings the night before or even in the morning before you came to Mass, your mind would be ready to receive whatever is going to be proclaimed in the homily much better. So it's, again, preparation makes the Word of God come alive. So every time you come Sunday, it would be so, so beneficial. I just want to tell you 100% more beneficial if you already have the readings in your heart and in your mind, you've already gone through them. You don't have to spend a lot of time. It's five, 10 minutes to read, even less than 10 minutes. Five minutes would be plenty to read the scriptures. So you already have them in your heart. And then what we do is we take the scriptures and take the homily and we, we, we honor it by saying, this is what we believe. This is what we raise to God. And it's the creed. There's been people who have died uh, over the creed. People who have proclaimed, this is what I believe and uh, become martyrs. And so the creed is this incredible gift for the church that this is what we hold as true. And then as, as I read in Justin Martyr's uh, explanation of the Eucharist in the second century, uh, it's not enough just to proclaim we have to pray. And we have to pray not for ourselves, but for the whole world. And so you'll see the prayers of the faithful are really powerful way, ways of saying that Christian community is not about itself. It's about others' needs. It's about raising up uh, prayers for justice and peace and raising up prayers for healing, raising up prayers to, for reconciliation and, and prayers that just for ourselves. And then finally for prayers of our beloved dead. You know, we have always remember that we have uh, 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 the church suffering in purgatory that we need to pray for. And so that's what we're doing. And then, and then that's all a preparation for liturgy of the Eucharist. And here it is, the offertory, the priest raises up bread and raises up wine. He says, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. It's, it's actually very similar to the Passover Jewish blessing prayer. Baruch Adonai, blessings of God. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. It's a beautiful imitation or, 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 or an understanding of that blessing prayer of the, Pas the Paschal Feast or the Passover that Jesus would have prayed. And so the church does the same thing. He blesses wine and blesses bread and says, you gave us this, now they're gonna be transformed into a, a, a greater blessing. And so you have the preface and the sanctus, the, the holy, holy, these prayers are to give thanks. It's that the meaning of Eucharist, Eucharist is thanksgiving uh, for the work of God's salvation on us. And it remain, or causes us to understand the reason for our gratitude. And so the preface, which is the, pre, the prayer preface, means before the Eucharistic prayer, is preparing our hearts to be thankful what we're now going to be praying, which is the Eucharistic prayer, the Eucharistic prayer. Right before that, it's very interesting. And you, if you watch the gestures of the priest, you'll understand that this is one of the more important gestures that he has. It's called the epiclesis. And he extends his hands over the bread and the wine, and he pray, pray, prays that the Holy Spirit sanctify these, these gifts, that they become, and he makes a sign, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that say? It's not the priest that's consecrating. It's the Holy Spirit through the priest and the words of Jesus that's consecrating. And so this, this is really, now we're starting to get into the mysteries, isn't it? We're just called the Holy Spirit down to consecrate this bread and, 
and, and, and, this, and this wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We are entering into an incredible, tremendous mystery right now. And we should be in awe at this moment as we hear those words. And so then the consecration itself takes place within the context of the Eucharistic prayer. There's four Eucharistic prayers that we have. The first from the Roman uh, canon uh, was prayed in Latin for many, many, well, for over uh, nine, 1900 years. And then the church and the Vatican Council added three more Eucharistic prayers. But the key to the Eucharistic prayer is again, focusing on the words of Jesus, the consecration words that Jesus said at the Last Supper. Now, you remember when we talked about Jesus being the Lamb of God and there was a Paschal feast and, and the apostles looked around and says, well, on every Passover, you have to have a lamb. Where's the lamb? He says, I'm the lamb. I'm the one that's gonna give you a body. I'm the one that's gonna give you my blood. And so that's the beautiful thing about the Eucharistic prayer. The priest speaks the words of Jesus. This is my body. This is a chalice of my blood. He elevates the host. And at that time, it's a, a time of again, great worship, isn't it? It's a time of saying, Lord, this is be, you're before me. This transformation of the Holy Eucharist now is the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. And it's a time to adore and thank and worship. And that's so important. Again, we're entering the mystery. It's like walking into a door and each door, you go deeper and deeper into the mystery. And now it's just so amazing. It's so amazing. We don't understand it completely, but we can receive it completely. Now that's what's amazing. We don't have to fully understand it, but we can receive it fully for the graces that it's going to give us on the Holy Eucharist. Then the on the Mises and the offerings and the intercessions, it's, it's, it's the remembering. The Paschal mystery is present in the Mass. The priests ask God to accept his offerings of Christ himself and make intercession for the behalf of the living and the dead, especially when, if a Mass is offered for a certain person or a certain intention. So it's a remembering what he's done. So it's made present for us today. And we're changed by participating in the Holy Eucharist. Then the doxology and the amen. And this is the lifting up the hosts and precious body and blood. The priest gives glory and honor to God through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, you have all the glory and you have all, all, the, all the glory. And at that moment, uh, it's called the great amen. Now, oftentimes I find we don't understand at that moment, the congregation should raise up their, their hearts to the Lord as we've done in Eucharistic prayer, lift up your hearts. We should raise up our voices and our hearts and say, amen, this is it. Yes, it is, it's Christ. There was talk about when, when the early church and the home churches, it would, the great amen was so great that it would rattle the doors. People would be, amen, with such an amazing enthusiasm, you would, you would hear it, you would experience the gift of recognition that what they're about to receive now is indeed body and blood, soul, and duty of Jesus Christ. The amen is this, yes, yes, Lord, yes. And so I, I would... I suggest that one of the things we could do as a, as a congregation, as Catholics, is to remember the Amen is for everyone to say yes. And, and it, we say it in unison. So maybe it's, it's not a moment for a quiet Amen. Maybe it's a moment for a more enthusiastic Amen from the congregation. So then we have the communion rite. And the, we start out again. Now the Eucharistic prayer is done. Now we start out and we move into the Lord's Prayer which is a model of all prayer, expresses all our dispositions, or our needs, and, and it's a way of making us worthy for communion. We, there's a beautiful time of, in the Our Father where he says, you, you give us daily bread, we're reconciled, forgive those who trespass against us, and pr protect us from all evil. And so there's a, there's a way of saying, okay, this, I'm getting ready to receive the Eucharist by praying the Lord's Prayer. And then the sign of peace, where the church asks God, for unity, remember in, again, Justin Martyr's experience of the church, this is founded in the Catechism, by the way, a beautiful explanation of the Eucharist. You could read that and really get a great, greater understanding of the Eucharist by reading the Catechism on the Holy Eucharist. But remember, there was a time when they stopped and gave the kiss of peace to everyone, that everybody who was there had to be reconciled before they received the Eucharist. And it's so with the kiss of peace is very meaningful when we recognize that it's about not just saying hi to somebody, 
but it's really passing Christ to each other in, in our hearts and our lives so that we can receive Christ fully in the Holy Eucharist. Then there's the fraction rite and the Agnus Dei, or the Lamb of God. The priest breaks the host as a sign of the faithful receiving the body and blood of Christ. And he says, Agnus Dei, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the have mercy on us. Lambs of, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Then he holds it up, and this is so beautiful. He says, look, if you're here, you're invited to the Lamb's Supper. Now you're gonna receive what every heart desires, which is full recognition and unity with God through his Son. And, you, and you're gonna be filled with the graces of what communion means, which is communion, coming into union with God. Now, that's amazing. So communion, the faithful are fed with the body and blood of Christ. And again, we come with our hearts ready. Either we receive them on, on our tongue in reverence or we receive in our hands either way. It can be deeply reverent and, and deeply ready to receive the gift. And then the, after that, we go back and pray some and recognize in thanksgiving what we've received. And then there's a final prayer and a final blessing. Of course, in the American church, we have announcements. <laughs> but the final blessing is really the priest prays for the faithful, sends them out on the Christian mission to the world. The mass doesn't end, it continues. It continues into our life. So what we received from the Word of God, what we received in the Holy Eucharist, is meant to be impacting everything we do for the rest of the week. You see, Sunday is the first day of the week not the last. If you look at a Catholic calendar, Sunday is the first day. If you look at a secular calendar, Monday is the first day. Monday is not the first day for us. Sunday is. Sunday prepares us for the rest of the week. You, have, you go to Mass on Sunday, you go to church on Sunday, the rest of the week is blessed. You don't, the rest of the week is not blessed. So it's the beginning of our week. And so now we've prepared our hearts, we've heard the Word of God, we receive Christ in the Eucharist, now I'm ready to do the battle, to be a Christian in the world. And that's the call of every one of us to bring Christ into the world. So let's just do a quick summary here. The introduction rite is the command or the, uh, excuse me, the communal preparation of the rest of the mass. And so it's, it's preparing us. It's, you always have preparations for something, right? This is the preparation rite. And then there's a little bit of so we can hear the word of God, so we can be a pay attention to what the gospel, what Jesus Christ is saying in his gospel. And then the priest or the deacon explains to some degree how this might apply to our life. It helps us. The liturgy of the Eucharist is a presentation of the sacrifice of Calvary, making present Jesus Christ on the altar. Now this, again, this is amazing. This is a mystery beyond a mystery. And when we recognize that, when we talk, you know, we come kind of casual. Maybe it's we come with a sense of awe that this is what I'm going to be participating in. And then the communion rite is receiving. We're in communion. We are in union with the Father through the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Eucharist opens up this gateway to God. And now we have uh, Christ within us in the Holy Eucharist. And we have his divinity mixing with our humanity. And it's an amazing gift, amazing reality uh, amazing faithful gift from the Lord. And then a conclusion, right, to again, call us to what? Uh, call us to not just pray separate from our life, but to take our prayer into our life. See, it's not something that that's, this is sacred and the rest is secular. That the sacredness of the Eucharist inf invests into the rest of our life to bring the graces into what, who we are at home and our work and our, 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 whatever our job is, whatever our role is, vocation is, that the Mass is meant to be taken into our life. Uh, so it's not just shutting the door and we do, it, we do the Mass here and, the, and outside we, we live a different life. It's exactly opposite. We take what do, we do here into our life. And so we, we have this communion with Christ here, then we can have a communion with Christ in, our, in the midst of our marriage, in the midst of our home and our family and our work. We're gonna be Christ's disciples, taking to the world what, what we have discovered about ourselves and what the call is in the Holy Eucharist. Um, 
the mass, again, many people don't realize where the word mass comes from. It comes from the Latin, et est, go the mass is ended. Go, the mass is ended. That's the Latin, et est. And so what you're saying is go what you have received, take now into your life, live the Christian gospel. This is now the bread of life and the cup of salvation. This is now the food that you need to live the daily life as, as, as good, deep Christians, as Catholics who understand the gift that they've received. Now, let's just do basic five part structure. Now, if you know all these, you are an amazing Catholic because most Catholics couldn't, probably couldn't name them. But after this video, you're going to all be able to name them. So what do you do first? The inner, whoops, excuse me. So what do you do first? The introductory rite, of course. What do you do second? The liturgy of the word. Then what's next? Let's see if you can know. The liturgy of the Eucharist. And then what? Most interesting and important is the communion rite. And then finally, what's last? Yeah, the concluding rite. So the Mass, there is a structure of the Mass. This structure was, as we read, Justin Martyr in 155 AD already was pretty much set. And so that structure has been for 2,000 years a way in which the Christian community gathers. The Christian community did not gather for Bible studies or praise and worship studies or, or anything else. They gathered around the Eucharist in their homes and then later in, in because the Catholic community, the Christian community got large, then they would have larger homes, which is what churches are, is just the home of Christ. It's, it's the God's, God's house, as I said to a child this morning. Welcome to God's house. And so we're here in this home as the Christian family, worshiping God from the very beginning as it was from the very beginning uh, to take our, our hearts, lift them up to the Lord and learn what it means to pray and worship and being transformed by the graces of the word of God and the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. But that's the, that's the ritual that the church has been going through over and over and over and over for the last 2000 years. It's quite beautiful. And so now, just a simple prayer to end up. It's an ancient prayer about the Eucharist. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O sacred banquet in which Christ is received as food, the memory of his passion renewed, the soul is filled with grace, and a pledge of his life to come is given us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God bless you in this journey into the deep riches of the Catholic faith.